Hello, friends. This is lecture four of a series where we go through the book on quantum mechanics by Steven Weinberg. This is part four of chapter three on the general principles of quantum mechanics. As explained in the first lecture, we will be reading the book in the sequence: chapter three, then two, followed by one, and continue from there according to the regular order of the book. In the last lecture. We ended with a derivation of the Campbell-Baker Hausdorff formula. In this lecture, we shall make use of this result to show how a symmetry group can be defined solely from the commutators of Hermitian operators. Once again, demonstrating the fundamental importance of these objects, we shall finally explain how quantum systems evolve in time, which brings us to the famous Schrödinger's equation. And ended by showing how the classical laws of motions can arise from quantum mechanics. Now let's resume our discussion of symmetries. Among our last results, we have shown that symmetry transformations on state vectors can be represented by unitary operators. The implication is that if we transform all the vectors in the Hilbert space. Which contains the states of our system, then all transition probabilities between states would remain unchanged. Since all unitary operators share this feature, and probabilities are all that quantum mechanics predicts about the physical world, this means symmetry transformations will become trivial, and we won't be able to distinguish between unitary operators that represent different symmetries. Therefore, to reveal the different physical effects of symmetries, we need to transform the system under observation, but not the observer. This means applying the unitary operator to the current state of the system. But not to the observer, which is assumed to be represented by all the possible measurements that he could make on the system. These includes all the observables of the system and their possible outcomes upon measurement, which are represented by the corresponding vector bases. These eigenstates of observables are unchanged by symmetries. The effects of a symmetry transformation is summarized in the yellow box. The result of this is that the probabilities of measurement outcomes are now affected by these transformations, as can be seen when we look at the probability of finding the outcome m i when observing a system in an initial state psi. This probability transforms in the following way. This is obviously not equal to the original probability. Therefore, symmetry transformations can now be distinguished physically by these changes. We can look at symmetry transformations from two perspectives, which are physically equivalent. The one we have just introduced, which changes the state of the system but not the observer, is known as the Schrödinger's picture of symmetry transformation. Let's look at the transform probability again. If we group the unitary operator with the cat psi, that is, with psi, we conclude that the state changes, but not the observable. This is the Schrödinger's picture. On the other hand, if we group u with the bra psi instead, then the observable changes, but not the state. This is summarized in the yellow box above. Notice that when we flip the bra into a cat, u becomes u dagger, as required by Hermitian conjugation. This is an alternative view of symmetry transformation, which is called the Heisenberg's picture. Notice that the probability remains the same between the two pictures. In fact, so is the probability amplitude. Often, when a transformation is applied to the state. It is called an active transformation.
while if it acts on the observer, in other words, the reference frame, it is called a passive transformation. These two pictures are equivalent as long as we apply them consistently throughout our calculations. Also note that transforming the system is equivalent to transforming the reference frame in an opposite way. This is quite in line with our intuition of what the transformation does. Let's take a closer look at the Heisenberg's picture. How does this change an observable? Recall that any observable can be represented by the following operator constructed out of its eigenstates and eigenvalues. Since we know how the eigenstates are transformed under symmetry, the transformation of the observable, M, follows directly. The expression in the green box can be written as M sandwiched by U dagger U. Thus we know how the operator representing an observable transforms under symmetry. If we calculate the average value of M when the system is in the state psi, this average transforms as the following. This is basically the transform M within the bracket of psi, since psi is unchanged. Alternatively, we can look at this from the Schrodinger's picture, where U is grouped with psi, and M remains unchanged. Both give the same transformation law for the average value of an observable. If we know how an observable transforms in the Heisenberg's picture, we can easily deduce how powers of it transforms. Using the definition of a unitary operator, we can insert identity operators in between factors of M. Grouping them together, we see that the result is just M prime raised to the same power. This obviously holds for arbitrary powers. In fact, the same transformation law holds for any functions of observables. These functions are transformed simply by replacing each observable by their transformed version in the respective arguments of the function. This can be seen just by expanding f as a power series. Therefore, functions of observables transform in the same way as observables under symmetries. They could themselves be observables if they were Hermitian. This remarkable transformation property is all due to the fact that symmetries are represented by unitary operators. Let's take a look at group theory to see what it says about how symmetries combine. More precisely, if two transformations that are from the same symmetry group act one after another, what is the resulting transformation? Recall that two transformations are from the same group if they are generated by the same set of Hermitian generators. This question is best answered by the CBH formula. Let's motivate the expression in the yellow box by using the Schrodinger's picture of symmetry transformations. The continuous symmetry we are looking at is represented by a unitary operator with parameters epsilons labeling the different elements in the group. Now let two elements of this group act on the state side consecutively. First u epsilon 1, then u epsilon 2. The resulting product of the two unitary operators will be the Ea and Eb in the CBH formula. That is, we set A and B as the following. To find out what is the result of u epsilon 2 times u epsilon 1, we need the commutator of a and b. 
This will allow us to evaluate the commutator terms on the right-hand side of the CBH formula. We already know what the general feature of this product should be. It is reasonable to assume that the combination of two elements of the same symmetry should also come from the same symmetry. This is in fact part of the definition of a group, which states that a group is closed under composition. Therefore, the resulting element is of the form u epsilon 3. Where epsilon 3 is some function of epsilon 1 and 2. The exact functional relation depends on the specific group under consideration. But is this requirement on group closure really possible? What are the necessary conditions on the generators for this to work? It turns out that if we require the commutator between any two generators of the group to be a linear combination of generators from the same group, this will ensure group closure under composition. We say that the generators form an algebra if they satisfy such commutation relations. This is known as a Lie algebra, named after the Norwegian mathematician Sophus Lie. The coefficients of these linear combinations are called the structure constants. These commutation relations define the group of symmetry. They completely describe how group elements combine, as we shall see. A specific group will have a specific set of structure constants. It is not difficult to see why such commutation relations implies u epsilon 3 would also be an exponential of the linear combination of the same generators. Just look at the terms in the exponent on the right hand side of the CBH formula. If the commutator of A and B is linear in generators, putting this in a second order nested commutator with either A or B would result in a commutator of two operators linear in generators, which by the Lie algebra in the green box is again linear in T. We may iterate this process to build higher order nested commutators, and the result will always remain linear in generators. Let's look at this in detail. It would be helpful to rewrite the commutation relations by including an i for each t and define these as t tildes. The commutators will then read schematically as t tilde combines with t tilde to give some other t tildes. Now, as we have described, Put this into another commutator with some generator t tilde c. Since the commutator of t tilde a and b is a linear combination in t tilde, the second order commutator will also be linear in t tilde by our commutation relations. It's obvious that if we continue to build this up to a commutator of arbitrary order, the result will remain as some linear combination of t tildes. This immediately suggests that the terms in the CBH formula, consisting of commutators of increasing order, is just a linear combination of t tildes. Thus, we have proof that the combination of two elements of a group will give a third element from the same group. Also notice that the expansion coefficient, capital F, of a nested commutator of arbitrary order is completely determined by the structure constant. This suggests that epsilon 3 of the resulting transformation is also completely determined as a function of epsilon 1 and 2, once the Lie algebra is known, according to the CBH formula. A symmetry is defined by how its elements combine, thus the Lie algebra defines the symmetry. Now let's look at a specific example of symmetries, 
Spatial translations. The effects of spatial translation is best shown by looking at how it changes position eigenstates. Going to the Heisenberg's picture, the bra of the position eigenstate is transformed in the following way. The eigenvalue of the initial state x is shifted by minus a. The minus sign is added by convention, while the vector a is the parameter of the transformation. Therefore, the bra x prime is the result of the unitary operator u a acting on the bra x. u a is the translation operator. In the Heisenberg's picture, observables like the position operator transform in the following way, as we have shown. Recall that the position operator X has this cat bra representation in terms of its eigenstates. Since from the yellow box above, we know how these states transform, consequently, this tells us how the operator transforms. Just replace the x states by x prime. We can rewrite the expression in the green box by changing the integration variable x, which is just shifting it by a. The result can be broken up into two parts. The first is the original position operator, while the second is just the identity multiplied by the translation vector a. The overall effects of spatial translation is thus a shift in the position operator, like so, while the current state of the system remains unchanged. This is certainly an intuitive picture of translation, and matches our expectation of what a translation should look like. But how do we construct the UA that will give us this result? Recall that we can express UA in terms of its generators. Since the translational parameter A is a three-dimensional vector, it can be paired with a set of three generators, TIs, one for each spatial direction. These can be assembled in the vector operator T. The question then becomes, how do we construct T that will give us the result in the yellow box? In other words, what are the generators of translations? As before, it is often helpful to look at infinitesimal transformations such that the generator appears only at linear order and its effect shows up in a more transparent manner. Let's put this back into the transformation and keep the result up to linear order in A. Then we require that the generator T does its job to effect the transformation in the yellow box above. And we are left with this commutation relation. This is the condition T has to satisfy to be a generator of UA. We can simplify this further by reverting to vector components. Note that the free index i, which is not summed over, matches on both sides of the equation, as it should be. This equation is only satisfied if the commutator of xi and tj is equal to i times delta ij. And we end up with a commutator that looks familiar. Let's write t as p over h bar, where p is the momentum operator. t has to have a unit of 1 over length, since the exponent of the translation operator must be dimensionless and a is of unit length. Substituting this back, we get the familiar canonical commutation relations between position and momentum. This is required by the transformation law above.
This is an alternative way to define the momentum operator as generators of spatial translations. The translation operator now becomes Suppose we don't know anything about the momentum operator P, including the fact that its components all commute with each other. Is it possible to deduce this purely from the transformation law of translations? To answer this question, we need to create a situation which would involve the commutators between different components of momentum. The CBH formula tells us that we should examine the result of two successive translations. A translation of A1 followed by A2 looks like this. The result is just another translation, with its parameter being simply the sum of A1 and A2. This implies the above composition law for the corresponding unitary operators. Since A1 and A2 are arbitrary, comparing this result with the CBH formula, we conclude that components of the momentum operator must commute with each other. In this example, we have derived the Lie algebra of spatial translations given the transformation law of the symmetry. But from the CBH formula, the algebra also determines the composition law. Thus, the relation works both ways. Usually, we follow the arrow in this direction, since most of the time the composition law is already known while the algebra is to be determined. The Lie algebra provides a criteria for us to construct operators that represent observables like momentum in Hilbert space. Let's see how spatial translations affect wave functions in position space. The rules for the translation of position eigenstates in the Heisenberg's picture will be useful for this purpose. The initial wave function psi x is just a projection of the initial state psi onto a position state x. By the transformation rule above, the wave function of the translation would be Note that in the Heisenberg's picture, psi does not transform. Thus, the translated wave function is psi x minus a. If we plot this out, it will look like this. This is why the minus sign is introduced to a, so that the wave function is displaced along this vector. Let's expand bra x minus a in a power series with a as expansion variable. Bra x can be factored out of the series because it is independent of n. And once again, we see that what's in the green box is the series of an exponential function. Del x in the exponent is the derivative on bra x. Since the state psi is arbitrary, it can be factored away. This shows how the translation operator affects the position eigenstate. If we take the derivative of a on both sides of the equation, then set a equals to zero, we end up with this equation. This shows how the momentum operator p acts on the position state. Recall that we have previously derived this same relation based on the idea of de Broglie's waves. Here it is the result of translational symmetry. Let's use this equation to derive the wave function of the momentum eigenstates, which are actually de Broglie's waves. Multiplying both sides of the equation with a momentum cat, 
and using the momentum eigenvector equation. We end up with a differential equation for the momentum wave function. The solution of this equation has the exponential form of a plane wave. The normalizing factor is such that the momentum wave function is normalized to a delta function. We have already derived this when talking about the integral representation of the Dirac's delta function. We now talk about how a multiparticle system transforms under spatial translations. Suppose we have a system of n particles and want to describe the whole system with a quantum state psi. The most straightforward way to do this is to independently assign a quantum state to each particle. These individual states are tied together symbolically by what is called a tensor product. Often, this will be expressed in the notation below for simplicity, where it is assumed that the state of each particle can be independently specified. We can think of this as a simultaneous eigenstate of the observables of every particle. With this, one assumes that the observables of different particles can be measured independently and simultaneously, thus implying that these observables commute with each other. We call this a product state. These are states which can be expressed as a tensor product of independently assigned single particle states. As we shall see, these states are not the only possibilities, and there exist states in which there are more intimate core relations between particles, called quantum entanglement. Let's look at the example of a two-particle state. This should illustrate all the features that would be shared by a system of an arbitrary number of particles. Suppose both particles are in momentum eigenstates where the first slot of the cat carries the quantum numbers of the first particle, while the second slot is reserved for the second particle. This generalizes easily to an n-particle system. This is the eigenstate of the momentum operators P1 and P2, which represents the momentum of particle 1 and the momentum of particle 2 respectively, in a two-particle Hilbert space. These are vector operators, each consisting of three spatial components. This notation generalizes readily to a system of arbitrary number of particles, with the subscript of the momentum vector indicating the particle to which it belongs. We can also write this in component form, with one index indicating the specific particle, and the other labeling which vector component. This implies that they commute with each other. With this constraint, let's see if we can construct the momentum operators of a two-particle system using what we have done for the single-particle case. For P1 and P2, the following constructions will be good guesses. Where the vector P and the identity are single-particle operators. We can see that P1 only acts as a momentum operator for the first slot and does nothing to the second slot. The reverse is true for P2. This is exactly how individual momentum should act in a multiparticle system. Let's see how these two momentum operators multiply. The single particle operators in each slot only act on the corresponding operators in the same slot. We see that the result is symmetric between the two slots, and therefore the product P1, P2 is equal to P2, P1. This means the two momentum commute with each other, therefore the definition in the yellow box satisfies the right commutation relations. 
This result is in fact guaranteed by our choice of using the single particle momentum and the identity operator as ingredients, since they all commute with each other. Here we clarify that multiplying two momentum operators means doing it component-wise. Let's see how these operators act on the two-particle momentum state. Just let the operators act on the states in their respective slots. And we see that the effect of P1 on the two-particle state just brings out the momentum eigenvalue of particle 1. This is exactly how the momentum operator of particle 1 should behave. The operator P2 behaves in a similar manner. The total momentum operator of the two-particle system is then simply the sum of the individual momentum operators. Here we bring up a potential confusion. The sum of two tensor products is not equal to the sum of operators in each individual slot. In this sense, the tensor product is really like a regular product. Let's look at the most general operator in a two-particle system. We have as ingredients the collection of all operators that live in the Hilbert spaces of each individual particle. Any arbitrary two-particle operator can therefore be written as a linear combination of tensor products of some operators from Hilbert space 1 and others from Hilbert space 2. In a similar manner, one could build any two-particle state out of states from the Hilbert spaces of particle 1 and particle 2. Once again, the most general state is a linear combination of the tensor product of states from these Hilbert spaces. In some cases, if the two-particle state can be written as just a single tensor product of states, it is called a product state, and by definition, it contains no quantum entanglement. Otherwise, if a state can only be written as a sum of more than one tensor products, then there must be some quantum entanglement between the two particles. Loosely speaking, quantum entanglement is a type of quantum core relation that could exist in the quantum state of a multi-particle system. When several particles come together and interact with each other, they usually end up in such states, and the different particles become somewhat correlated to each other. Here, we shall not go too deeply into the discussion of quantum entanglement, as it is a major topic for a later lecture. What we are trying to emphasize is that, once we have single particle states and observables, it is then a simple matter of taking the tensor products of these objects to build their multi-particle counterparts. Let's now look at the momentum of the n-particle system using the formalism we have developed. As before, we insert the single particle momentum operator in the slot occupied by a specific particle, with the rest of the slots filled with identity operators to create the corresponding momentum operator. Again, all these individual momentum commute with each other in a trivial way. Similarly, we have the operators representing the positions of individual particles in an n-particle system. The slots are filled according to the same conventions as momentum, except with the single particle position operator instead. This leads to the following commutation relations between position and momentum. The first delta function is due to the fact that observables of different particles commute. 
The commutator is non-zero only when single particle position and momentum operators meet at the same slot, that is, when they belong to the same particle. The second delta function is just the usual result of the canonical commutation relations for single particles. We are now ready to discuss the spatial translations of an n-particle system. Recall that spatial translations are generated by the momentum of the system, which in this case is the total momentum operator. The resulting translation operator can be expressed as the product of separate translation operators on each individual particle. This is possible because the momentum operators of different particles commute with each other. Therefore, the ordering of these individual translation operators is also not important. The effect of an individual translation operator generated by the momentum of the nth particle on the position operator of a different particle just leaves the position unchanged if m is not equal to n. This is due to the canonical commutation relations of the n-particle system. The translation operator could then just move past xn and neutralize its inverse. If however n is equal to m and the translation and position operator both belong to particle m, we then get the same result as the single particle case. So if we apply the full translation operator to xm, we expect all the individual translation operators not belonging to particle m to move past xm and neutralize their inverse, with the exception of the translation operator belonging to m. And so we end up with the result of the single particle translation. Since m is an arbitrary particle index, this means the entire n particle system is translated by the same vector a. Let's look at some further examples of tensor products and derive some useful identities in the process. Let's start with the eigenvector equation for the position of the nth particle. Both the position operator and the position state can be expressed in the tensor product form with single particle states and operators as the components. Looking at the position operator, we may further express its single particle components in their cap bra representations. Putting all these together, we have a cap bra representation of operator xm with its single particle components made explicit in the yellow box above. On the other hand, we could have derived the cap bra representation of xm directly from the eigenvector equation it satisfies. In this case, we have a multi-particle cap bra representation of xm in which the single particle representation is not explicit. This is in contrast with the expression in the yellow box. Both represent the position operator of particle m in an n-particle system. Comparing these two expressions allows us to equate the operators in the integrand. Recall that the multiparticle position state has the product form as in the blue box. Therefore, the cat bra in the green box can be written like so. Thus we have three equivalent cat bras. In particular, 
The equation in the yellow box shows us how the tensor products of cat bras can be factorized. There's a more direct way to see this result in a general way. Let's assume that all the bras and cats are normalized. We can show that the operators on the left hand side and right hand side are equal if they give the same results when acting on any state. Let's look at the left hand side and examine the typical single particle cat bra it contains. When acting on the state phi m, this gives psi m. But when acting on any state that are orthogonal to phi m, we get zero. These are basically the only possibilities since any state is either proportional or orthogonal to phi m. So if we have a state that is proportional to the phi product state, where alpha is the constant of proportionality. The action of the cat bra tensor product on this state should give us, which is just the tensor product of all the cat's psi of the cat bra. But this is exactly the same result that the operator on the right hand side would give. Otherwise, if we even have a single state that is orthogonal to cat phi in this tensor product, the result will be zero. Again, this is also what the right hand side would give. These cover all the possibilities. Therefore, this equation is valid. After this interlude on tensor products, let's see how an n particle wave function behaves under translations. In the Heisenberg's picture, we claim that the translation operator acts on the position eigenbra to give the following result. That is, the positions of all particles are translated by the same vector a. We could probably guess this result from the expression we have derived previously. That ua can be expressed as the product of all translations on individual particles. But let's do this more carefully by using the definitions of the multi-particle states and operators in terms of the tensor products of single particle objects. That way, we could use all the results we have derived for the single particle case. First, let's look at the individual translation operator that acts only on particle 1, expanding this exponential as a power series. We could write the operator a dot p1 in terms of its tensor product definition, which is then raised to the power of n. Since all the other entries are identity operators, we could bring the power n directly to a dot p, where p is the single particle momentum operator. Substitute this back to the power series. It is obvious that the first term in the tensor product sums back to an exponential function, since the rest of the entries are identity operators and is independent of the summation index. This exponential is just a single particle translation operator, while the whole tensor product is the n particle operator that translates only particle 1. This result is general and applies to other particles with the single particle translation operator inserted into the appropriate slots. Putting this all together implies that the product of all individual translations, which is the full translation, is just equal to the following tensor product, where all entries are the single particle translator. We can now use the previous result of how the single particle translation operator transforms the single particle position state. Since the multi-particle position state is also a simple tensor product, each position state in this product is simply translated by the same vector. Remember, operators in each slot only act on the states in the same slot. This gives the result in the yellow box above.
With this result, it is a simple matter to derive the translation of the multi-particle wave function. The initial wave function is given by After translation, we get Using the result in the yellow box, we have Up till now, we have not defined how the multi-particle states are normalized. Let's do it now. For the position eigenstates, what we meant by normalization is to be able to fill in the right-hand side of this equation. As we know, the inner product of two states is a measure of how alike they are to each other. So we should expect zero on the right-hand side, where not all particles of the two states are exactly at the same positions. A good way to do this is to make pairwise comparisons regarding each particle. This could be accomplished with the following expression. Which is the product of all the inner products of single particle states. Where once again, we could use the previous single particle results. This satisfies the criteria of distinguishing multi-particle position states as each delta function is only non-zero when its argument is zero. This also implies that the inner product of two product states is just the product of inner products. This is consistent with the rule that whatever is in each slot in a tensor product only acts on objects in the same slot. In general, we can derive the multi-particle inner product from the single particle case by using this rule. Using the relation between the tensor product and inner product in the lower equation, we can prove the linearity of the tensor product. We will just show this linearity for the second argument, as the proof is identical for both arguments. The key is to use the linearity of the inner product. Let's take an inner product of our state with an arbitrary product state, psi phi. Using the rule for taking the inner product of product states that we have just derived, we get here we use the linearity of the inner product. Let's take a closer look at this result. Notice that we can again write the products of the inner products as inner products of tensor product states. In the last equality, we have used the linearity of the inner product to factor out the bra in the green box. This last result can be equated with the expression we have from right in the beginning. Since the product state in the green box is arbitrary, we get the result. Hence we have shown the linearity of the tensor product from the linearity of the inner product. To complete our discussion of spatial translations, let's now look at how momentum eigenstates transform. The result is quite trivial, since the translation operator is composed entirely out of momentum operators, and the bra it is acting on is its eigenstate. You simply replace the total momentum operator with its corresponding eigenvalue. The resulting exponential is just an overall phase factor. This has no physical effects as the probabilities of subsequent measurements on the state are not affected at all. Similarly, the momentum operators are left unchanged since all momentum operators commute with each other.
Now let's talk about time translational symmetry. Time translations basically describe how systems evolve in time. Previously, all we have talked about is how to specify the state of a system and what is the probability of a measured outcome at a given moment. These are the subjects of kinematics, what could be observed. We now introduce the dynamics, that is, how systems change in time. This is the last piece of the puzzle to complete the standard theory of quantum mechanics. Let's start with the Schrodinger's picture. Suppose the system is in an initial state psi at time t equals zero. After a time delta t has elapsed, the system is now in a state psi of delta t. This final state is the result of a time translation operator u of delta t acting on the initial state. The generator of this unitary operator is called the Hamiltonian. It is a Hermitian operator which also represents the total energy of a system. This is so by definition, as we define the generator of time translation as the total energy. The same way we define the Hermitian operators of other observables like momentum from the symmetries they generate. Another justification for defining the Hamiltonian as the energy is that it is automatically conserved as energy should be. We shall show this in a moment. With the time translation operator, we can write the state at any given time as ut acting on some initial state at some earlier reference time which we take to be t equals zero. Note that the time translation operator is also called the time evolution operator. We now wish to derive a differential equation in time of the state psi t. Notice that all the time dependence is carried in the unitary operator ut. Therefore, if we take the time derivative of psi t, it acts only on ut. This is equal to h u or u h which are equal since u and h commute with each other by the definition in the green box. We have added an ih bar to cancel the corresponding factor in the exponential. And the result is where ut and psi zero can be combined to give psi t. Thus we have arrived at the time evolution differential equation for psi t. This is the famous Schrodinger's equation. It tells us how the state of a quantum system evolves in time. Incidentally, this is where the Schrodinger's picture came from, as in this picture, the state transforms but not the observables. The two equations in the yellow boxes are basically equivalent, with the lower box as the differential version of the top. We have just derived the Schrodinger's equation from the unitary evolution of the state. It would be a good exercise to now show that the Schrodinger's equation leads to unitary evolution. The equation in the yellow box is of the form where the derivative of the function is just equal to a constant multiplied by the same function. This is the signature of an exponential function. This allows us to derive the general solution to the differential equation. The solution is general because it contains exactly one constant of integration, which is required for a first order equation. This constant fixes the value of the function at a given time, which we have chosen to be t equals zero. Now just set the constants in this solution for the case relevant to the yellow box. And we have the general solution to the Schrodinger's equation. Thus the Schrodinger's equation implies unitary evolution. With this, the problem of quantum dynamics is reduced to specifying the initial state and finding the appropriate Hamiltonian that describes the system. 
Note that we have assumed that the Hamiltonian in the Schrodinger's equation is time independent and therefore leads to the equation in the lower box upon integration. However, the Schrodinger's equation is actually more general than that and will hold even for the case of a time dependent Hamiltonian. So the conclusion of this implication might not hold in this case. But even for the time dependent case, the result is still an unitary evolution with only some modifications to the result in the lower box. This time dependent case will be discussed extensively in a later lecture. For this lecture, we shall assume H to be time independent. To gain an alternate perspective, we now look at time translation in Heisenberg's picture. That is, how observables transform under time translation. Once again, all the time dependence of observable A is carried by U and U dagger. Taking the time derivative, we have by the product rule. The derivatives of U and U dagger are straightforward as before. The time dependent A is identified in the yellow boxes. And we end up with the commutator of the Hamiltonian and AT on the right hand side. This is known as the Heisenberg's equation of motion. It tells us how the observables of a quantum system evolve in time. This is the origin of the Heisenberg's picture where only the observables transform under time translation while the state of the system is unchanged. There could be a more general situation where we have a function of observables that could have an additional time dependence. This is the parametric time dependence, where t exists in the function simply as a parameter and is not the time of the observable variables. How do we evaluate the time derivative of f? We first separate the dynamical time dependence carried in the unitary operator ut from the parametric time dependence in a more explicit way. This is possible because, due to the unitarity of ut, any powers of at can be written as u acting on the same powers of a at zero. If we think of f as a power series in A, this would imply that the time dependence of A in f could just be brought out in the UTs. Notice that the parametric time dependence is just the time dependence of the C number coefficients of the power series. Since the time derivative of AT through differentiating UT gives this previous result, the same works for the function f. Except by the product rule of derivatives, there is an additional term due to the partial derivative with respect to the parametric t. Note that partial t means the derivative with respect to the second argument. This is in accordance with the convention of partial derivatives. And the result is a more general form of the Heisenberg's equation of motion. Note that observables that evolve in time in a purely unitary way are called dynamical variables. Since the Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator, Let's see how it evolves in time as an observable. We take the most general case where the Hamiltonian might have a parametric time dependence. So taking the time derivative by applying the equation of motion in the yellow box, we have. Note that the first term which describes the dynamical time dependence is just zero, since the Hamiltonian commutes with itself. Here we have hidden the argument of H for simplicity.
This would imply that the Hamiltonian changes with time only if it contains C number parameters that are dependent on time. This is the parametric time dependence. These C number parameters are not directly described by quantum mechanics, but are usually put in to represent the background or environment that surrounds the quantum system. They are themselves unchanged by their contact with the quantum system and can be described by deterministic time evolution with good approximation. Therefore, the Hamiltonian changes with time only if the quantum system interacts with a time-varying background. We shall see more examples of this later in this course. We now talk about how symmetries lead to conservation laws. A conservation law tells us which physical quantities remain unchanged over time. This works by the application of the Heisenberg's equation of motion. By using this equation, we have assumed that the observables we are looking at are dynamical variables with no parametric time dependence. The time derivative of an observable A is zero if it commutes with the Hamiltonian. This means if A is equal to the Hamiltonian, it is automatically conserved. So if we define the Hamiltonian of a system as its energy, we will automatically have the conservation of energy, which is a nice thing to have. Note that this definition is also consistent with the fact that the Hamiltonian changes with time when the environment of the quantum system changes with time. We have derived this as a parametric time dependence. This makes sense since this is the situation where the system interacts with the environment and exchange energy, so the energy of the system by itself should not be conserved. But how do we actually determine the Hamiltonian of the system? We do so with the help of classical mechanics. Even though quantum mechanics is the actual underlying law that governs the physical world, but if we make measurements at low resolutions where the wave properties of particles are hidden, classical mechanics is a very good approximation. So if one takes some kind of classical limit of quantum mechanics, we should reproduce the predictions of classical mechanics. This sort of requirement provides a good constraint for us to determine the actual form of the Hamiltonian operator based on our knowledge of the corresponding classical counterpart. This is known as the correspondence principle. Here's how it works. Suppose we have a state psi which describes a particle. Let's look at its wave function in position space to see how the position of the particle is distributed over space. The value of psi x could be negative or even complex, and its absolute square tells us the probability of where we could find the particle. Let's find this particle by scanning the x-axis with measurements of resolution rx. The larger Rx is, the lower the resolution. This resolution means that we are only able to tell which interval the particle is in, but not its waveform within the interval. Suppose after such a measurement, we find a particle in an interval centered at x0, with a probability roughly the absolute square of psi x0, which in detail is the integral of the absolute square of psi x over the interval at x0. Of course, we could have found a particle in all the different intervals with the associated probabilities. The point is that finally we will localize the particle to within just one interval, with a measurement of this resolution. Assuming that we end up locating the particle within the interval at x0. As a result, the original state psi is reduced to a new state psi prime after measurement. The wave function of psi prime has a width that is restricted to within the resolution Rx immediately after the measurement. But the exact form of this wave function is not known to the observer at this resolution. 
And if we were to make another position measurement on the particle right away at the same resolution, we would find the particle in the same interval at x0 with a 100% probability. Furthermore, for an ideal measurement, the state psi prime will remain undisturbed. Making a comparison, the initial state psi with its broader waveform that is wider than the resolution, in which the probabilities to find a particle in many different positions are finite, is just like a wave. While the final state psi prime, which is narrower than the resolution, and in which we could locate the particle absolutely at one position, is like a particle. It is this relatively particle-like state that could be described by classical mechanics, as its wave character is hidden under a finite resolution. Note that psi prime is not a position eigenstate, as it is not infinitely sharp but spreads over a finite interval. This means the wave function of psi prime in momentum space also has a finite width. Recall that this momentum space wave function is not independent of its counterpart in position space, but is related by a Fourier transformation, as we have shown in the last lecture. This wave function in momentum space is therefore also not a momentum eigenstate, and there is uncertainty in the particle's momentum. Suppose we also measure the momentum of the particle with a finite resolution Rp, which is greater than the width of psi prime in momentum space. Then similar to the case of position measurement, we would not see the waveform or the momentum uncertainties at this resolution, but only get a definite momentum value, which is roughly equal to the average momentum. This means, at the imperfect resolution of Rx and Rp, the particle has both definite position and momentum, and can be described by classical mechanics. Recall that the uncertainties here are defined by the standard deviation. It is important to note that these statements about uncertainties are rather ambiguous, because they are after all dimensionful quantities, and we must clarify with which quantities of similar dimensions are they very small in comparison? The Heisenberg's uncertainty relation will tell us. All quantum states must obey this inequality, and this puts a constraint on both position and momentum uncertainties. The product of delta x and delta p must therefore be roughly greater than h bar, while the product of the resolutions rx and rp must be even greater so that the uncertainties will be invisible to the observer. This gives us a concrete definition for the classical limit. This is the limit of low-resolution observations where the quantum phenomena is hidden. In this limit, position and momentum could be measured simultaneously to a good approximation, as the uncertainties of both variables are practically zero, and thus nearly deterministic. Therefore, classical mechanics provides a valid description of the particle, hence we call it the classical limit. This set of approximations implies the following probability distributions. Where the probability of the particle being in the position x0 is 1, and the probabilities of all other positions are 0. Similarly, there is only one probable value for the particle's momentum. These probabilities lead to an interesting result, where the mean value of the quantity x to the power of n is approximately equal to the mean value of x raised to the same power. That is, we could bring the power into the mean value. This is due to the fact that the probability of x0 is equal to 1. The same also applies to the momentum. The identities in the blue box will be important for our next step. We can now answer the question, 
How do we determine the Hamiltonian of a system? Let's use the free particle as an example. Since the Hamiltonian is also the energy of the system, in the classical limit, its mean value should approach the familiar form in classical mechanics, where P0 is the average momentum, and M is the mass of the particle. Using the approximations in the blue box, we should get Comparing the operators and the brackets on both sides of this equation, we obtain the Hamiltonian. This is the operator assignment that would give the correct classical limit. Let's see how this affects time evolution. In the Heisenberg's picture, the time evolution of an observable is given by Applying this to the momentum operator, we have where ut is generated by the free particle Hamiltonian. In this equation, we have assumed that the momentum is a dynamical variable. Let's take a little time to see why this is so. The momentum, together with the position operator, forms a canonical conjugated pair of variables. This means they satisfy the canonical commutation relation. We will see that this can only be true for all times when both variables are dynamical. Let's apply the equations in the yellow box to the commutator. Due to the unitarity of ut, it can be brought out of the argument of a function like so. We have shown this previously. So similarly, ut can be brought out of the commutator. This implies that if the canonical commutation relation is satisfied at t equals 0, it will be satisfied for all times. Hence we see that x and p must be dynamical variables for this relation to be satisfied at all times. The canonical commutation relation is important because it is the key quantization condition which encodes wave-particle duality, as we have shown in the last lecture. Going back to our Hamiltonian, let's substitute in the expression for momentum. Since H does not contain any parametric time dependence, it must be time independent, therefore we get the last equality. For simplicity, let's hide the time argument when t equals 0. Since h is a function of just momentum and is the generator of ut, this means ut commutes with p. This implies that momentum is conserved. We can also deduce this from the Heisenberg's equation of motion, in which h commutes with pt. This is precisely the result expected in classical mechanics, which predicts that in the absence of a force, the momentum of a particle is constant. In quantum mechanics, this means if we look at the momentum of a state psi, which has a definite momentum p0, at time t equals 0, we would find the value p0. And if the measurement is repeated at an arbitrary time t, we would find that the momentum of the state remains unchanged, which implies that the momentum of the particle is conserved. It is important to note that in this discussion, we are looking at things through the Heisenberg's picture, and it is the operators and not the states that could change with time. The free particle example is rather trivial. Let's look at more general Hamiltonians. The class of Hamiltonians which we will study extensively in this course is for a particle moving in a potential. Vx is a potential field acting on the particle and is dependent only on its position. The source of this field is not described quantum mechanically and is basically some macroscopic body which acts on our quantum particle, but is otherwise unaffected by this interaction. That is, 
It suffers no back reactions and is essentially static. X and P are both dynamical variables describing the particle. Let's look at how the particle's momentum changes with time using the Heisenberg's equation of motion. Once again, because H is time independent, we are free to substitute any time for the arguments of its variables. Let's put in this expression for H in the green box. The first commutator is obviously zero. For the second, we could use the identity in the yellow box which we have derived in the last lecture. This is basically the consequence of the product rule for commutators. So the second term gives the derivative of the potential with respect to the position vector. Just to remind you, this derivative gives the vector. It is a gradient differential operator. Notice that on the right hand side, we have the negative of the gradient of potential. This we recognize from classical mechanics as a conservative force. Thus the time derivative of the momentum operator is equal to a force operator that is dependent on the position operator of the particle. This is just Newton's law, but with operators instead of ordinary vector functions of time. If somehow we could replace the operators with some corresponding C number variables, we would recover the classical equation. This is done by taking the classical limit. Taking the mean value of the operator equation and using the identities for the classical limit in the blue box, we could bring the bracket of state psi straight into the argument of f on the right hand side, and on the left hand side, bring psi under the time derivative, since psi is time independent. And indeed, we obtain the correct classical equation of motion if we identify the classical dynamical variables as the mean values x0 and p0, which are approximately deterministic trajectories, since the uncertainties are effectively zero. It appears that all these approximations on the classical limit can simply be replaced by the following rule. Much like what we have said before. So by this rule, the Hamiltonian reaches the classical limit. But conversely, if we have the classical form of H, we can quantize it by replacing all C number variables by operators. In this course, this is the direction we would take most of the time. Let's also look at the time derivative of position. Once again, to evaluate this commutator, we can use the product rule. And we get a result that is familiar from classical mechanics. The velocity of a particle is equal to its momentum over mass, as can be seen by taking the classical limit. In conclusion, we have obtained a Hamiltonian operator which gives us equations of motion that have the correct classical limit for a particle moving in a potential. Thus quantum mechanics is capable of reproducing the results of classical mechanics as well as introducing quantum uncertainties at higher resolutions. We have reached the end of this video. This concludes Chapter 3, Part 4 of Weinberg's book on quantum mechanics. If you find this video helpful, 
consider giving it a like and subscribe to this channel so that you can follow along as we go through the whole book. See you next time and thanks for watching.